uh, I feel feel that like I should be sort of hiding under the table with embarrassment at all those kind of things you've been saying about me. But, uh, I shall press on instead. Uh, now I have to just persuade the uh, this to uh, right. Uh, so archaeology can tell us many things about the past, but inevitably, since the information is based on material remains, it can only obliquely tell us about the lives of individuals and little, little or nothing about their feelings. Monumental, or as I would prefer to call them, formal inscriptions, also give us a lot of information about institutions, rulers, political, uh, social and religious practices, etc., but seldom tell us much about the daily lives of individuals and their thoughts, which is the stuff of diaries, memoirs and autobiographies. To take one example at random, in the kingdoms of ancient South Arabia, it was the custom for those who had transgressed religious ordinances to make a public confession, recorded and displayed uh, in the, uh, uh, sorry, rec a public confession recorded and displayed in a public inscription. One might think that these at least would give us an insight into a moment in the life of an individual. However, these texts are extremely formulaic and in fact, monotonously repetitive. And so instead of telling us something about the lives of the sinners, they in fact give us that next to nothing, except that the sinner had committed a breach of ritual purity. It's obvious that to understand the thoughts and emotions of individuals, one needs documents, letters, literature, etc., all things which are sorely lacking in the area of the Middle East between Egypt and Mesopotamia, presumably because they were written on perishable materials in climates where these do not tend to survive. However, there was one group of people between the first century BC and the fourth century AD who left personal information on surfaces where, for the most part, it has survived. These were the nomads in the deserts of what is now southern Syria, eastern Jordan, and northern Saudi Arabia, who, for reasons we cannot be sure of, learnt to read and write and covered the desert rocks with their graffiti. These deserts were mostly huge areas known as Harra, or basalt desert, uh, consisting of broken up lava flows which poured eastwards from the volcanoes on Jebel al Arab, formerly Jebel Druze. How did this strange situation arise? We cannot prove it, but this seems, to me at least, a probable explanation. And as far as I know, no one has yet come up with a more convincing theory. Until the widespread use of mobile phones, nomads have seldom had much use for literacy, especially in antiquity, when before the availability of cheap paper, they did not have much to write on. Papyrus was expensive outside Egypt, they had more urgent uses for leather, and they didn't carry much pottery, because in a nomadic existence it tended to get broken. So unlike settled peoples who used bits of broken pot as we use paper, they had no shirts to write on. Thus, nomadic societies tended to be non-literate or oral, societies in which memory and word of mouth were used for record and communication, the things for which we depend on reading and writing. Nomadic life also breeds curiosity. In the desert, if you're not curious about something you can't immediately explain, you're likely to end up dead or without some of your animals. So if a nomad went to one of the oases in northwest Arabia, say to trade, he may well have seen somebody writing and being curious, may have asked, what are you doing? <coughs> if the writer was, writer was kind enough not to show him away, the nomad may have asked him for a lesson in how to write. I myself have had this experience on a dig in Jordan in the early 1970s, when a Bedouin workman saw me writing notes and asked me to teach him to write. I wrote out the unjoined forms of the Arabic letters, pronouncing them as I did so. And the next day he was writing my name and his in the unjoined forms of the Arabic letters. I quote this incident just to show how quickly someone can learn if he or she has always used his memory for storing uh, all information rather than relying on writing things down. 
What is also extraordinary is how the non-literate nomad quickly adapts to a script which does not represent all the sounds he expresses in speech. In the case of the Arabic script, this is short vowels, but in the case of the ancient South Semitic scripts used by the ancient nomads, it was long and short vowels and even diphthongs. An even more extreme example than the one I have just quoted occurred at the excavations of the site of Lachish in Palestine in the early 1930s, when the famous Lachish letters were discovered. These are letters written in ink on potsherds, calling for reinforcements to save the besieged city. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, they were found in the gatehouse where the messengers had been killed by the attackers before they could leave. The text, texts are in the Paleo-Hebrew script, and some of the non-literate Bedouin workmen asked one of the excavators, Gerald Langster Harding, to teach it to them. They learnt it very quickly and were soon writing notes to each other and to Harding in their Arabic dialect expressed in the Paleo-Hebrew script. Despite the fact that it only had 22 characters to express the 27 consonants in their dialect. Unfortunately, none of these notes survive, but if one were to be discovered by a future excavator, I tremble to think what it might do to Semitic historical linguistics. If our ancient nomad, having learnt the alphabet in an oasis, then went back to his family in the desert, he may well have shown them his new skill. And this could then have spread more or less as a game. Since there was nothing to write on except rocks, widespread literacy did not change their society into a literate one in the sense of a society that relies on reading and writing for its fundamental functions, government, commerce, religion, etc. Instead, the society of these nomads remained an oral or non-literate one, relying on memory and word of mouth, despite the fact that very large numbers of its members could read and write. This paradox can perhaps be more easily appreciated if we think of the opposite situation, a literate society, in the sense just explained, in which the vast majority of the population is illiterate, as in medieval Europe. <clears throat> there is a modern parallel to these ancient nomads. Um, oh, sorry, I think I need to go back. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, there is a modern parallel to these ancient nomads. The nomadic Tuareg in Northwest Africa had their own script, the Tafina, which the children used for games and adults for carving graffiti or lovers to write each other secret notes, etc. <coughs> Yet until the last few decades, it was never used for anything of practical use and Tuareg society remained an entirely non-literate one. If a Tuareg wanted to write a letter to another Tuareg or draw up a contract, they would get someone who had been to school to write it in Arabic or French, even though the recipient would then have to ask someone to read or translate it for them. An anthrop anthropologist once suggests that, suggested that the extremely rich Tuareg oral literature should be written down in the Tafina script, and this was greeted with horror. For the whole point of oral literature, of course, is that it isn't fixed by writing, but is fresh and subtly different each time it was, is recited. The same is true of genealogy among both the uh, modern Bedouin and the Tuareg. The structure of all social groups is explain, explained in genealogical terms. Thus gene genealogy is used to explain political and other events within a society or between, or between societies. The genealogy therefore has to be fluid. If it is fixed, it can no longer serve this purpose. Thus, if two sections of a tribe which have been politically and socially close for many years fall out, the genealogy is unconsciously adjusted, owing, showing that they were not as genealogically close as had previously mistakenly been thought. History in such a society is therefore what a sufficient number of people think they remember. If it is written down, it loses this flexibility 
and therefore its ability to be used to explain events. I shall return to genealogy in a moment. So there was no practical use for literacy among these ancient nomads, but there was one almost universal problem it could help to solve. Solitary boredom, especially when watching the camels, sheep and goats pasturing. Carving graffiti on the basalt rocks of the Hara helped pass the time. And because they had a lot of time on their hands, these nomads often wrote quite long and detailed descriptions of what they were doing or had been doing or would like to be doing. Or the local gossip from both within the desert and from the Herodian and Nabataean kingdoms and the Roman provinces of Syria and Arabia. News travels fast uh, in the desert and these nomads seem to have been remarkably well informed. But most of, that, of all, they talk about their own situations their emotions and their vulnerability from drought, lack of pasture, disease, wild animals, raiders or Roman soldiers. Their texts usually end with a prayer to a number of different deities, asking above all for security, but also rain, booty if they are on, an, on a raid, a change of circumstances, re revenge for the death of a loved one, etc. In fact, these graffiti are more like the scattered leaves of multiple diaries, or the thin wooden tablets with cursive Latin messages, letters, lists, etc., which have been found near Hadrian's Wall and in London and elsewhere, which have been brilliantly deciphered in recent years, bringing their author's society back to life with such intensity. However, unlike the wooden tablets, which serve the practical purposes of communication and record, these uh, uh, sorry, uh, a communication record. These diary entries are more like stream of consciousness writing. We also need to keep in mind that the authors, of course, knew what they meant. And since they were simply expressing themselves, not trying to communicate with others, they felt no need to explain their allusions to things that are not immediately obvious to us or that which we cannot know. There was a basic structure to most of their texts, the name plus a long or short genealogy, then a narrative saying what they were feeling or what they or other people were doing, etc. And finally, a prayer to one or more deities. I'm so sorry about this. Um, yes, so that. Uh, yes. How, uh, right. Yeah, so there was a basic structure, uh, the name plus a long or short genealogy, then a narrative saying what they were feeling and uh, what they or other people were doing, etc. And finally, a prayer to one or more deities. But then the author quite often has another thought and so adds another bit of narrative, possibly followed by another prayer and so on. Moreover, within the narratives, there is no logical sequence of statements, but one apparently random thought after another. We need to appreciate that it takes quite a long time to carve these graffiti, so there was plenty of opportunity for the author's mind to race ahead or wander. What these graffiti allow us to do is not to re reconstruct the life of one person, but to have glimpses of events and emotions in the lives of tens of thousands of individuals. They are like a gigantic version of BBC Radio 4's The Listening Project, but stretching over four or 500 years. And it's something we only have from the nomads. There is no equivalent for any of their contemporaries in the countryside or the towns. By the happy coincidence of accidental literacy and the daily requirements of pastoral life, these chinks in the wall of time allow us not only to glimpse an ancient society, but the raw thoughts, emotions and actions of innumerable individuals within it. As I've said, 
Their society was structured genealogically, and each individual belonged to a series of larger and larger lineage groups. The smallest was probably the immediate family, or rather those who shared the same tent, Ahal. All larger groups were referred to as Al, with no distinction between relatively small groups or large confederations, or even kingdoms such as Herodians or empires, such as the Roman, uh, such as the Herodians or empires such as the Romans. But in the longer genealogies, genealogies, sorry, uh, we can see the names of smaller Arles on the way up to the two large confederations, which were called Daif and Awiv. Individuals express their identities either by taking their genealogy back to a recognizable clan or tribal name, or by the Gentilic or Nispa, the Daifite, the Kaunite, etc., or most commonly by the expression he, she, or they of such and such a lineage group. It is possible that, as in later, Bedou later Bedouin culture, an individual's relationship with a paternal uncle was of, of great importance, and very on, often a boy was named after him. It's interesting, however, that the word for paternal uncle is dad, uh, cognate with Aramaic dada, whilst um, the word used in Arabic for this important relation, means paternal grandfather in Safiitic. The word for maternal grandfather was jid, which is the normal word for either grandfather in modern Arabic. As in most Semitic languages, um, sorry, we also find uh, quite often variations on the practice called paponymy of naming the eldest son after his grandfather. As in most Semitic languages, there are no specific words for cousin, and instead son or daughter of paternal or maternal uncle are used. Similarly, sister's son, brother's daughter, etc., are used instead of nephew and niece. Wives, sons, daughters, and slaves are also mentioned. As you can see on the screen, this author, like many others, grieved for a large number of relatives who, he says, were struck down by fate. It's not certain what exactly is meant by this, but it seems to imply that they had met an untimely death. Of course, as in most ancient and alas modern societies, glimpses of women's lives are heavily outnumbered by insights, insights into those of men. But at least women were not entirely silent. And this is to be expected, for in the nomadic life, everyone, male or female, has to work outside as well as inside the tent and women play a far more public role than they can in the cities. Although the vast majority of the inscriptions are by men, we have just over 80 so far by women. The majority of these are simply on rocks and in the desert, like those of the men. But there are a number also on stone uh, bowls, beakers and tripod platters. Unfortunately, none of these has ever been found in a scientific excavation, and all are in museums and private collections, so we don't know anything about the circumstances of their use, for instance, whether it was domestic or ritual. The subject matter of the texts on these is similar to that of the inscriptions on rocks and boulders, except that there is a much higher proportion of texts which say that their authors were missing someone. We also have inscriptions by some slaves, and it's interesting to note that they describe themselves not A, son of B, but as X, the slave of A, son of B, i.e., as in many parts of the world, slaves were convention conventionally treated as not having fathers, only masters. A stark reminder of the loss of identity suffered by slaves throughout history. According to some anthropologists, slaves among the Bedouin in the 1960s and 70s were treated as family members, but without the responsibilities of a tribesman or woman. True, they could of course only marry another slave, but they could do business and sometimes became richer than their masters. Moreover, before raiding was stopped, they and their property were protected in raids. They were also free from revenge attacks, which only affected their owners. However, much has changed. And unfortunately, these advantages are probably only rarely enjoyed by the slaves of the modern Bedouin. We do not know 
where the conditions were similar among the ancient nomads, at least for male slaves. We, alas, have no graffiti by male and female slaves. Certainly, it's clear that male slaves did not do all the work. The vast majority of the graffiti, tens of thousands, which tell us about the working lives of their authors, are not by slaves, but by free men and women. This stone bears inscriptions by a father, his seven sons, and his slave. The texts are all identical, saying that they were helping the goats give birth, a very important annual activity. Quote, the year Caesar announced the province, <clears throat> I probably AD 111, when Trajan finally announced Arabia Adquisita, five years after the actual annexation in 106. Slaves were probably often captives from other tribes whose families may have been un uh, unable to ransom them. They seem to have retained their tribal lineage, as in the lower text, even if not their genealogy. On the other hand, the upper text suggests that a slave could be the property of a lineage group as a whole, rather than of a particular member of it. I mean, it could be quite a small lineage group. In this case, uh, this, is the, uh, uh, this is the only text in which this lineage group is mentioned, so it may have been quite small, for instance, just an extended family. This text appears to say that this slave had served in a military unit, possibly in the Roman army though alas, it's not clear whether this was before or after his enslavement. These nomads seem to have lived in small groups of tents, moving around whenever they, wherever they could find pasture for their animals. Their year began in October, when many of them started scanning the skies for rain clouds. Once they got news that satisfactory rains had arrived further east and or southeast, many of them, though by no means all, moved from the Harra to the inner desert, which they called Madbar, either the limestone plains of the Hamad to the east or southeast to the sands of the Mafud. If there was sufficient rain, they would stay there throughout the winter, Shitta, uh, say until February or early March, when they would begin to return to the Harra for the season of later rains, which they called Datha. As I've said, the Harra consists of broken up lava flows, and the chemicals which leach out of these rocks produce extremely rich soil, which only needs water to produce abundant herbage. The stony cover of the, the stony cover of the earth also means that the dampness in the soil beneath lasts much longer than in the more exposed areas further east. But the rains are very patchy, so only some areas provide pasture at any one time. The place with the most reliable pasture is the Rukhba in southern Syria, into which the wadis carrying the vast fl floods flowing down from the Jabal al-Arab to Buch. The nomads would stay in the Harra uh, uh, as long as the pasture lasted, normally through the season of later rains and the early summer, Saif, roughly mid-April to early June. However, by late June, most of what was left of the pasture had been burnt off by scorching heat, or eaten up. And in the dry period, known as Qayyib, between late June and October, most of the nomads camped by places of permanent water, Mahadir, and fed the animals on dry fodder, Alaf, until the rains came again in October, if they did. The graffiti described this pattern with many individual variations, either because the rains in the Hamad or the Harra failed, or for more personal reasons. Indeed, some of them went in the opposite direction, that is, westwards onto the Jebel al-Arab, or further west onto the Haran plain and even Gilead, especially in times of drought. Since the rain almost always comes from the, the west, that is, ultimately from the Mediterranean, these areas were more likely than the desert to have received it. But sometimes even the Haran would, could be a disappointment and they would be forced back into the Harra where it was even worse as described in this inscription. Rain is understandably one of the things for which they prayed fervently to Baal Shamin, the Lord of Heaven. And they would make pilgrimages to his famous temple at the town of Sia on Jebel al Arab. One text is sadly dated to the year the pilgrimage to Sia was in vain. 
When the rain did not come, the nomads described it as Baal Shemin, withholding it. A number of the inscriptions say that their authors performed sacrifices, but only rarely do they provide any information as to what they sacrificed or to which deity. Again, an effect of their knowing what they were writing about and so not needing to specify. Yeah, sorry. Uh, when, the, uh, when they do say, um, when they do specify the deity to whom they were sacrificing, they often follow it immediately with a prayer to a different one, as on the right, uh, which might seem to us bad manners, but apparently was perfectly acceptable to the numerous divinities who were worshipped. A number of inscriptions, uh, right, sorry. Sorry, several authors say that they sacrificed before migrating to the inner desert, which is understandable. And incidentally, the picture on the right is a nice example of how these graffiti can wander all over one or more stones. The record I, 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 I found is a, one inscription going over 11 faces of adjoining stones. Another religious activity was setting up standing, a standing stone to a deity. And the way they expressed this was to set up the deity using the word Nasaba uh, to set up a standing stone, but with the deity as the direct object, thus Nasaba Halat, he set up a standing stone to Halat. Their daily activities were those of desert pastoralists, finding grazing for their camels, sheep and goats. And it's quite clear that there was no division between those who herded camels and those who had smaller livestock, as imagined in the past by some anthropologists for the modern Bedouin. All three animals are needed in the daily life of the nomadic pastoralist when the conditions permit, as they do in the Hadra. All three provide milk, the basis of the nomad's diet. But because of the gestation period, and because the gestation period of sheep and goats is much shorter than that of camels, they provide a much more regular supply of milk. Goat hair is used for the weaving of tents and sheep's wool for clothes, blankets, etc. But dromedary hair, unlike that of Bactrian camels, is much less plentiful and less tough, and so tends to be used for more decorative or luxury goods. Many of the inscriptions record the birthing of the goats, which seems to have been an important annual event, as I mentioned before, and is often dated by an occurrence, uh, such as the year Caesar announced the province, as we've seen, but also the year of the expulsion of the Jews, or the year of an outbreak of disease, or an attack by a tribe from Northwest Arabia, or uniquely in year 18 of King Agrippa II, the only reference to a regnal year in these texts. However, only four texts mention lambing, and only two of these are dated, and none the birthing of camels. The latter may be because camels give birth in the winter and the newborn calves are much more vulnerable to intense cold than lambs or kids, so the ancient nomads, like their modern counterparts, almost certainly took them south to the Nafid, or southeast, to the Nafud sand desert to give birth. <coughs> and there have been far fewer expeditions looking for inscriptions in the Nafud than in, than in the Harra. Only occasionally do they mention hunting, perhaps because if you're lying in wait for game, you don't want to make any sound that could warn it, warn it off and carving on basalt can be a noisy business. On the other hand, many of their rock drawings show hunts both on horseback with, show it with, with throwing spears, as here, uh, or long, or long uh, thrusting lances, uh, as here, and on foot with bows and arrows. Uh, this chap looks somewhat outnumbered, and I suspect most of the gazelle may have survived this confrontation. They also used hounds, um, presumably these scenes were drawn, as you can see here, and it's interesting to note that the horse here, the, fe uh, the features of the horse are very similar to those of the uh, famous, famous Arab horse uh, today, the small head and the tail which goes upwards before going downwards. Not all the horses in these rock drawings are like this, but horribly the majority. They also, uh, sorry, uh, presumably these scenes were drawn after the event or in anticipation. 
There is one inscription saying that a wolf had taken the author's dog and another saying that the author was grieving because his dog had got lost. They hunted dangerous carnivores like lions, hyenas and wolves, as well as herbivores for food, such as ibex, oryx and gazelle. These hunts were not sporting activities, but an essential part of protection for themselves and their herds against carnivores and food, food gathering in the case of herbivores. Some archaeologists and anthropologists have made a false distinction between the hunter-gatherer way of life on the one hand and that of the pastoralist on the other. But these inscriptions and drawings show quite clearly that their authors used both herding and hunting, and this makes perfect sense. So on this face of the, 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 the inscription, the photograph you saw just now, and this, photo, and this uh, scene are on two sides of the same stone. This shows a prehistoric hunting trap called a kite being reused uh, uh, in the uh, early centuries uh, AD um, to corral goats. And we know they're goats because uh, the, the drawings they used had um, uh, certain conventions. And so particularly when you have stick figure animals like this, you use something that is um, uh, um, typical of a particular animal, such as here, the vertical tail of the goat, um, to show which it is. Uh, gazelle, for instance, are, are, are shown with uh, horizontal tails, short horizontal tails, uh, because that's how uh, a gazelle, what a gazelle uh, does, it, 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 how its tail is when it's in flight. So here you have he, uh, um, uh, have heard him. And on the previous one, if I can actually manage to go back now, yes, here, the previous one, um, you have hunting. Here is the man with a leash with uh, three dogs on it. And they seem to be hunting uh, onager, uh, wild asses, which are shown with a stalk-like tail and then a tassel at the end. Um, and, well, relatively long ears. Um, this man, of course, was almost certainly not lying down in order to shoot his bow and arrow, but uh, uh, perspective uh, was not, uh, had not been invented by the time these drawings were, were made. Um, so, these inscriptions draw and drawings show clearly that their authors used both herding and hunting, and this makes perfect sense. <coughs> Butchering their own domestic animals inevitably diminished their capital. So if they could not kill a wild one, so if, so if they could kill a wild one, so much the better. And I'm told that gazelle meat in particular is delicious. Uh, my apologies uh, for giving vegetarians the shivers. Uh, they also gathered uh, kama, uh, which are truffles. Um, a great delicacy to the Bedouin as to us, more especially since the desert truffles only develop in years when there has been a large amount of rain for several months. The truffles are then the icing on the cake amidst the general rejoicing. There were times when they had to go to war, especially against invading tribes from Northwest Arabia, such as the Lichianites or the Hawalat, who Pliny calls the Avalita. Their relationship with the Romans appears to have been relatively stable, and many of them say they served in the troops levied from the nomads by the Roman army. However, others write that they had mutinied and were on the run from the Romans. Occasionally, they would raid the camels of other tribes. This was not only a way of expanding their own camel herds, but also an opportunity to display valor. If I may do digress for a moment, uh, this drawing shows what incredibly skilled artists some of the nomads were. Basalt is extremely hard, and of course, when you're carving on rock, there is no way of covering up a mistake. The drawing shows a horseman raiding two camels. As in modern raiding, until it was stopped in the early part of the 20th century, you tried to stampede the camels and touch one or more with your lance, shouting, this one's mine, which is what the horseman is doing here. It's interesting that the drawing shows a Bactrian, two humped camel, as well as a dromedary, and has got their relative, proportion, relative proportions right. Bactrians, of course, come from Central Asia and are not native to Arabia, 
but they arrived in caravans along the Souk Road at places like Palmyra and Petra, where the nomads could buy them, or of course could steal them all uh, en route. The reason they bought or captured them was to mate them with their dromedaries to produce hybrids, which are bigger and stronger than either parent, and so could carry much heavier loads than the native dromedaries. Unfortunately, unlike in later periods I described a few minutes ago, singing and dancing girls were slaves and were considered to be le legitimate booty for raiders. And you can see on the slide the horseman touching the woman with his lance as he did with the camel, and the caption describes her as booty. These graffiti are always personal, sometimes startlingly so. This text, which gives the woman's name and patronym, goes on to say that she was having her period. One is tempted to say too much information, but it is in fact an excellent illustration of how the authors of these graffiti viewed their carvings as pure self-expression, right, like writing in a diary, rather than a communication with other, uh, sorry, rather with other, uh, People, sorry, I seem to have, um, rather than communication with other people. Um, uh, but the fact that uh, another mortal might find the text and read it does not seem to have mattered to the authors. Of course, it may also be that among the nomads who carved these texts, menstruation was not considered such an intimate private thing as it is for us but it is paralleled by the expressions of vulnerability, fear, depression, etc., carved by male members of the society. Thus we find texts in which the author says he had lost friend after friend after friend, or that he was hungry and cold, that he was in hiding and had run out of food, that he was migrating with his lineage group but was afraid, or was lost and lonely, or was afraid of one of the tribes which invaded from northwest Arabia, the Hawalat or afraid of losing his flocks because of dearth. Things that we might hesitate to carve permanently in a public place where it could be read by anyone. This tells us something about the society. In the desert, there is very little privacy. Even if you can't see someone, even if you can't see someone, it's highly likely that someone can see you. Life in a crowded tent among relatives you have grown up with and who know you only too well provides very little opportunity for secrecy. I would suggest that these circumstances produce a very low expectation of, and so possibly desire for, personal privacy. It is difficult to desire something which you cannot imagine. Thus, I think that what strikes us as an unexpected frankness in these diary leaves, carved in a public place where they could be read by anyone, was for these authors perfectly normal self-expression. Other people may get bored if you talk to them about your troubles, but you can always pour them out on the basalt, and maybe the gods and goddesses will take note. We know that many of these graffiti were read by others because it's very common for the reader to leave his or her own inscription nearby, saying that they had found the original one and were grief-stricken, possibly because the original author had since died or was far away and they missed them. Despite the sadness and loss often expressed in their text, these nomads also had fun. Uh, there are a number of drawings of entertainment accompanied by Sapphic inscriptions. Some of these show communal dancing with a man or woman playing the double flute, such as, uh, known as the mizmar, accompanied with tambourines and or drums. We know that the lyre was also very popular and was often played by women. There is an interesting drawing signed by a woman, the one on the right of the screen, alas known only from a hand copy, which, allows, which shows a woman with a lyre on the back of a donkey. It's not clear, clear whether it's a self-portrait. However, it's very similar to the drawing on the left by a man shown for comparison. Note the elaborate hairstyles of the women, which are very different from those I will show you in a, mo in a moment. But another form of entertainment was the singer and or dancer naked or semi-naked, swinging her hips, as indicated by the flying uh, tasseled belt, uh, belt uh, 
tassels on the belt, with her hands raised, drawing out her hair in a sexually provocative gesture, something, alas, I can't reproduce. Uh, some of these drawings show very clear physical arousal in the male audience. When the figure on the right was found in the mid 19th century, she was thought to be, uh, she was thought to be a goddess until the script was deciphered and it was seen that she was described in the caption as a slave girl. <clears throat> Unlike uh, the Hismaic graffiti in southern Jordan and northwestern Saudi Arabia, which contain quite a lot of sexual boasting, there are very few texts in the Hara with sexual references. However, of these few, some refer to shocking sexual abuse, as you can see on the screen. It's somehow made worse that the author follows this statement by the casual reference to the picture of a horseman he claims to have drawn above the text. It seems clear from this that the author felt no shame and apparently no hesitation in mentioning it in his open diary on the stone. I apologize for bringing the subject up, but it seems to me important if we're to try and understand the society whose members produced these diary leaves and their attitude to writing about their lives for all to read. There is another text in which the author gives his genealogy up to seven generations, so that there could be no mistake as to who he was. As you can see, he says he had sex with somebody else's slave girl. Like slaves in many culture, cultures, she bears the same name as her master, or more probably a name with the same consonants but slightly different vocalization. This again emphasizes that slaves in this society did not have the protections they seem to have had among the Bedouin of the recent past and could be vulnerable to the sexual predations of their masters and their friends. The puzzling text and drawing is this. The author says that he remembered a maiden. The word he used, kharid, virgin, comes from a root meaning bashful, grave, one who concealed herself from public view. Yet, it, yet he accompanies this text with one of the most naturalistic drawings of a naked woman in the corpus of Sapietic drawings. Without the drawing, one might have imagined a romantic, even sentimental background to the text. But with such an explicit drawing, one wonders what on earth happened. We rarely get to see the sort of clothes they wore, apart from the rather skimpy garments of the dancing girls. But this drawing suggests that the rider may be wearing something similar to the Izar and Rida, uh, the two garments worn by men on the pilgrimage to Mecca. The Izar is a cloth worn around the waist and the Rida is a shawl worn over the shoulders. They are believed to have been taken over from pre-Islamic Arabian costume and are said to be still the normal wear among the Afars uh, or Danakil in the Horn of Africa. The wild hair seems also to have been fashionable among the Bedouin several centuries later, at least among outlaws, since the pre-Islamic outlaw poet Shanfara boasts, using Alan Jones's translation, that he has a shock of hair such as when the wind blows on it, it sends flying tufts out from the sides, uncombed. It is long since it has been accustomed to the touch of grease or delousing. It is a matted tangle which has gone through a year unwashed." Unquote. One final curiosity, in the area where the Harra meets the Hama, a remarkable inscription was found by the Jordanian scholar Ziad al Sanamin, who has recently published it. As you can see, it's accompanied by a drawing of a boat and claims that the author spent 30 years on the two rivers, presumably the Tigris and Euphrates, a remarkable career for a nomadic pastoralist. I've likened these brief statements to leaves from diaries which give us thousands of momentary glimpses into the emotional, physical, and material lives of these nomads 2000 years ago. I speak under correction, of course, but as far as I know, these glimpses are unique and are not found in any other ancient society. They do not just provide us with the only linguistic and indigenous historical material we have for ancient nomads, but they sometimes speak to our emotions as from one human being to another. Thank you.